good afternoon to everyone i welcome all of you to the 52nd lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the department of nonlinear dynamics barbie thompson university with the support from prosa 2.0 i am happy to introduce today's speaker professor sandeep banerjee professor sandeep banerjee obtained phd in applied mathematics in the year 2001 he started his academic career as a lecturer at chitranjan college kolkata in the year 1997 itself and moved to st xavier's college kolkata as a senior lecturer in the year 2000 after working about 5 years he moved to the university of helsinki finland to carry out postdoctoral research after spending a couple of years in finland he came back to india and joined as an assistant professor at the department of mathematics iit roorkee he has been promoted to associate professor in the same department in the year 2012 and elevated to professor in the year 2020 for the past couple of years he is serving at various capacities at the department of mathematics iit roorkee professor banerji is working on different areas in mathematical physics sorry mathematical biology in particular he is working on mathematical modeling of interaction between tumor and the immune system the spatial aspect on its 3d visualization and mathematical modeling of plank and timex in passive stochastic environment and ecological dynamics of interacting populations mainly affects space and stochastic and while state structured pre data pre interaction with counter attack and parental care he has published a couple of books and contributed book chapters for few other cited editors also more than one of the awards has been awarded indo us fellowship he has also been felicitated by a medal by indo us technology forum for his contribution in indo us fellowship 2009 program at first indo us research fellowship conclave pune in the year 2010 18 Professor Banerjee has organized several workshops, conferences, seminars, and involved in course development for NPTEL and MHRD programs. Professor Banerjee has mobilized the grants through several international and national projects. Under his supervision, several students have obtained PhD. With this short introduction, now I invite Professor Sandeep Banerjee to deliver his lecture. Over to you, sir. thank you professor santivedan for a nice introduction uh, so let me and also thank you for inviting me for this talk so i guess the screen is visible now yes yes sir okay fine <clears throat> so though the title <coughs> says that i'm i will be talking about the dynamics of hepatitis c virus um, so i thought that a little introduction to the dynamical system the one which we use in the mathematical modeling so i will be talking of them a little and then moving to uh, an application so basically <clears throat> the three panels you see the left hand panel it's for the pure mathematicians and the right hand panel is the experimental biologists so i lie in the middle panel where i use mathematical tools uh, to formulate model and data from the experimental biologists uh, to to validate a model of a particular disease or a particular biological phenomenon now as we uh, as we do the subsequent analysis uh, there are a lot of uh, you know tools that we used that falls in the category of dynamical systems so i will be talking about them first and then move to the actual problem so the very first thing is i model with the help of differential equation and what you see here is a set of differential equation of autonomous system so by autonomous system i mean that this functions p and q are functions of x and y only there is not a function of t embedded in them if it is then it is called a non autonomous system otherwise it is an autonomous system the another word which we use frequently in our mathematical modeling is equilibrium point 
or steady state value. So this equilibrium point in here, sorry, uh, here it is given as critical point and is obtained by putting this equal to zero and this equal to zero. The question is why? Because we want to check the dynamics of the system where there is no change in the variable. So at this particular point, there is no change with respect to time. And that's why you put your dx dt equal to zero and dy dt equal to zero and calculate the point, whatever is coming. In this case, it is x zero and y zero. And hence this particular equation holds. So that is how you calculate your equilibrium point or steady state value or critical point. All this means is the same. <clears throat> and when we check the, st the stability of this equilibrium point, we mean an isolated equilibrium point, which means that there must exist, if there exists a circle of this form and where x0, y0 is the only critical point within this circle. So if such a circle exists, we say that the critical point is isolated. Okay, so this is a prelim preliminary that we often use the word the system is stable and the system is unstable or the system is asymptotically stable. So mathematically, what does that mean? For that, I have to define two uh, definitions you can say. So one is that I consider this equation throughout, which is numbered as 13.4. So that equation is dx dt equal to some fxy and dy dt equal to gxy. Let me just quickly check. Okay, p and q is here. So I will say p of xy and q of xy. <coughs> And this x equal to ft and y equal to gt, they be the solution of this differential equation. And basically they are the parametric solution. And the equilibrium point assumed to be zero, zero. Now we say the path approaches the critical point as t tends to plus infinity if limit t tends to plus infinity equal to zero and limit t tends to plus infinity gt equal to zero. So this is the definition which says that the path approaches the critical point. On the other hand, <clears throat> if limit t tends to plus infinity, the ratio gt by ft, it either exists or <clears throat> it becomes either positive or negative infinite as t tends to plus infinity, we say that the path C enters the critical point zero, zero. So one is the path approaches when this condition holds. Another is the path enters when this condition holds. Let me now come to the definition of stability. <coughs> So as usual, we consider that dx dt is equal to some p of xy and dy dt is equal to some q of xy. So this is the given differential equation and 0, 0 is a isolated critical point. And you have the solution x equal to ft and y equal to gt, which is also the parametric equation of the solution. Then you define a distance dt from the origin denoted by ft square plus gt square and square root of that. And now you give the mathematical definition of stability. It says that given any epsilon positive, there exists a delta positive such that for every path which follows this equation, dt0 is less than delta for some t0 then dt is less than delta for t greater or equal to t0. Now, this is something like, you know, epsilon delta definition of limit. So, just by looking into the, into the definition, it's a bit difficult to comprehend, but it becomes much easier if it is, you can visualize what is happening. Just hold on.
Uh, ah. So, what is happening actually? So, you, you have dt0 is less than delta. By dt0, if I substitute here, I get a, I get a uh, circle. I get a circle of radius delta square. And if I put it here, I get a circle of delta uh, of radius epsilon square. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, of radius epsilon. So, we say that 0, 0 is stable if you start from this point at the point t equal to t0. So, you have two circles, one is k1 and k2. So, 0, 0 will be stable if at time t equal to t0, the path which lies in within the circle k1 will lie within the circle k2 for t greater or equal to t0. So that is the meaning of the stability. Once again, uh, <coughs> the stability at the point 0, 0 will mean that the path which starts from the point t equal to 0, it is lying within the circle of radius delta and it is inside the circle k1. And if your 0, 0 is stable, then this path will lie within the circle k2 of radius epsilon for time t greater or equal to t0. If that happens, we say the <coughs> critical point 0, 0 is stable. Now, when it will be asymptotically stable? So the difference is, that now this is the definition for stability. So asymptotically stable means the system has to be stable, which means this has to hold. And along with that, <coughs> this two limit must be equal to zero. And what does this mean? That means the path must approach the critical point zero, zero. So this is the basic difference between the stability and the asymptotic stability. By stability, <coughs> you mean that the path which is already inside, uh, sorry, uh, the point which starts at t equal to 0, for 0, 0 to be stable, it is lying inside the circle of radius delta, must lie within the circle of radius epsilon for t greater or equal to t0. Now, for asymptotically stable, this much has to hold. That means the system has to be stable. And at the same time, you have these two limits, which must be equal to zero, which means that, <coughs> that the path must approach the critical point zero, zero. Next comes uh, stability. So in stability, what you do is, given a dynamical system Pxy and Qxy, you first linearize the terms. That is, you only keep the linear terms, as you can see, Ax plus By and Cx plus Dy. And you find the eigenvalues. So if <coughs> basically the roots of this characteristic equation. So once you get the roots, you see whether they are real and unequal. So if both the roots are negative, you say the system is asymptotically stable. If one of them is positive and one of them negative, you get a saddle point, which is an unstable case. And if both of them positive, they are unstable. However, if the roots are complex conjugates, that means if you get in the form A plus minus IB, then it forms a focus or a spiral point and its stability will depend on this particular value. If this A is less than zero, you get a stable focus. If this is greater than zero, you get an unstable focus. And if A is equal to zero, you have a purely imaginary root and you get what is called a center. Now, the question is, we deal with 
mostly we deal with non-linear system. The <coughs> points which I told you here, I told you it is true for the linear system, not the non-linear system. Now the question is, in most of these journals, you will see that people talk about the linear system, uh, sorry, the nonlinear system, they linearize it, they use this method, and then say that the nonlinear system is also stable. So, how that is possible? So, it is possible by this theorem. So, you can see that this is your nonlinear system. Then you write it in this form which is the linear part plus the nonlinear part. And then you ignore this part and you do your all stability analysis on this linear part. Now what happens is we have this particular theorem which says that if your P1 and Q1 means your nonlinear part, if they are <coughs> uh, continuous first partial derivatives and these limits hold then the linear system under which you state all these properties is also true for the nonlinear system so this we don't bother to show it in the research paper so it is sort of assumed that the one that this particular thing is holding though we need to check this so once this is true, then whatever properties you the, it holds for the linear system is also true for the nonlinear system. For example, if I only take this one, it says if lambda 1, lambda 2 are real and equal of the same sign, then not only 0, 0 is the node of 13.19, it is also node of 13.43. So 13.19 is this and 13.43 is this. So if it is true for 13.19, which is the linear system, it is also true for 13.43, which is the nonlinear system. <clears throat> the next part which we use is bifurcation. So bifurcation is something <clears throat> you have a system, you have a parameter, and as your system passes through that uh, parameter value, there is a change in the dynamics. And that change in the dynamics, uh, as you can see, that it gives a different kind of solution. That's a different kind of uh, qualitative behavior in the dynamics of the system. And that is when you say a bifurcation occurs and the point at which uh, this bifurcation occurs is called the bifurcating point. So at some particular value of this bifurcation, say if it is alpha, if such change started to occur, we say that say bifurcation occurs say at some point alpha equal to alpha zero. Now there are various kinds of bifurcation. <coughs> One of them is the saddle node bifurcation. So in saddle node bifurcation, what happens that you have a fixed point which is created and destroyed as your parameter uh, varies. So a very simple example would be something like this. So you can see if I put r less than zero, any value, so I will get x square. So I put r equal to minus two. So I get x square equal to two and I get x equal to plus minus root two. So I get two values. One is plus root two, one is minus root two. Say this is plus minus root two, this is plus root two. And I can step, check the stability that at minus root two, uh, the value is, uh, the uh, point is stable. At plus root two, the, uh, the point is unstable. Now as this r, it approaches zero. So this is say r now, I generalize it. Then uh, what happens is that uh, it coincides, it slowly moves towards the origin and once it crosses the value,
then it goes up that is your two uh, steady state they become zero and why it goes up because the moment your r is positive you take it to the left hand side and it becomes minus r and x square equal to minus r so x will be imaginary so there will be no intersection with the x axis if you want to visualize this you can see <clears throat> these two points they will be approaching now this is one and this is one and <clears throat> as the approach is zero these two points now become they just vanish because the i mean they becomes imaginary so this is exactly what is happening the dynamics is captured here so this is your saddle node bifurcation there is another bifurcation which we use uh, this is called transcritical bifurcation so in the saddle node bifurcation you have two uh, steady state or two equilibrium points or critical points which just vanishes once it crosses the bifurcating value in transcritical bifurcation there is a change of stability like <clears throat> if you take this equation one of them is x equal to 0 another is r so this is the zero part this is the r part <clears throat> now as r approaches this zero there is a switch of stability that means this if it, if, if this is uh, stable then this will cross this value so then this becomes unstable and this becomes stable so that is what happening in a transcritical bifurcation there is a change of stability so you have this equilibrium point you have this equilibrium point suppose this equilibrium point is uh, unstable and this equilibrium point is stable so as r crosses a particular value say rc the critical value then your zero becomes stable and your r becomes unstable just a change of stabilities and this is how it happens you can see this is just moving, 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 and then again coming up. So this becomes stable and now that becomes unstable once it crosses that particular <coughs> uh, bifurcating point. We have another one which is a pitch fog bifurcation. And <coughs> in pitch fog bifurcation, you have say from one fixed point to three fixed points, or from three fixed points to one fixed point so the first one is the supercritical and the second one is the subcritical it's more better if you see the uh, animation so this is you can see there is a stable point here and as it uh, passes through this bifurcating value let me it. Yeah. So you can see that now your stable point becomes unstable and it gives rise to two more stable points. And this is how you get the bifurcating diagram. And because it looks like a peach fork, the, hence the name peach fork bifurcation. Whereas this is the supercritical one. And the subcritical one, it's going to be where you have. three points one is stable and the other two is unstable so once it reaches uh, the bifurcating point you will see that all these three points will reduce to one and the stable one will become unstable yeah and that's how the figure goes Again, it is a pitchfork bifurcation because it looks like a pitchfork. And the last one I will be talk about, I will be talking about is the hop bifurcation. So in a hop bifurcation, what happens is you get a there's a stability switch and you get a periodic solution. So basically, you will have a solution of the form uh, a plus minus ib. Suppose this is minus. And 
the hop bifurcation will occur when this part becomes zero you will be left with only the imaginary points so suppose this is a stable focus so from the stable focus you will get a, a periodic solution when your value when your value of the real part becomes zero So this is what you are getting a stable focus. Yeah, this is where I'm stopping. Uh, so what you are getting is it's a stable focus. So if this is the point, so your thing will going to come like this. And this is exactly what is happening here and which is giving rise to a limit cycle this so it's a good animation this this is the formation of this limit cycle so if your point is somewhere like this and you have the limit cycle here so paths are coming they are trying to go to this point but cannot because of this limit cycle and they just converges around this among this uh, around this circle okay now let me come to the model so when you uh, model a virus so obviously you need to know about you know a little bit information about the virus so what i'm going to show is the application of this dynamical system in this particular model so i will emphasize more on that so as you can see that this uh, root of this virus is through the blood and this hepatitis c virus it causes uh, hepatitis c in humans which ultimately give rise to uh, cirrhosis of uh, liver. Uh, this is an animation that how the virus attacks the cell actually. So what you see here, this is the part which you have to be look into. This is the virus which is already inside the cell. So it is some sort of lock and key which the virus make the body believe. So this is the virus and these are various. So these are the keys which you see on the body of the virus. So they make believe the body that, okay, I am the right key. And the moment the body believes that the virus inside, enters inside the body. So basically they are, uh, they're attaching themselves to the other keys of the cell, which will let them enter. There are some sort of proteins, which ultimately they uh, sort of shape themselves in the form of the key. This is called cell receptor, like you can see here. And this will let the virus going inside the body. So that is how basically your virus enters your body. The same is true for hepatitis C virus. So why we are studying this? Because uh, as you can see that it is uh, the disease, it is not curable. So the once this virus enters in your body, it will stay there. With the medicine, you put it in the latent form but again, it can come up. And once it is inside the body, uh, what are the drugs that is available? One is this interferon alpha, and another is this ribavirin. These are the two drugs which can be avoid, uh, affordable by, by most of the people. And <clears throat> when you say you get a cure, when you attend what is called SVR, which is called the sustained virological response. So that means you have a blood count, you, you have the 
count of the virus per ml blood and you see that how much blood is uh, how much virus is there if it is 100 copies per ml of blood you say that you have uh, attained a cure now what does this interferon and riboberin does so interferon is some sort of protein which is inside your body and also they are available synthetically so they basically <clears throat> stop the viral replication because as we know the virus replicates and also kills and at the same time rivavirin is a drug which has been developed and they basically kill the hepatitis c virus and other viral infection this part so what we are trying to achieve with this model we are trying to mimic uh, the, rep the the dynamics that is seen in human beings so these are the the uh, results that ha happens in a human being once they are uh, affected with hepatitis c virus and once they have start the uh, taking the uh, antiviral drugs so i will explain what is this first phase and second phase with when it comes to my model and this is how your body gets infected by hepatitis c virus so what we will see is a liver and this is a healthy liver and this is the hepatitis c virus which whose entry is through blood the green one is the virus and it is covered by a fatty envelope it is called the single stranded rna and uh, so this fatty envelope it protects the virus so as it enters the blood it will emit some signal and somehow it will go where the liver cells are so once it comes near the liver cell it will enter that fatty acid will dissolve as you can see the virus enters the cell it replicates it affects the cell it goes out again covered by the fatty envelope goes to the next cell and that's all your body gets infected now let me come to the model so the model is the first one is the healthy liver cell the infected liver cell the infected virus the non infected virus <clears throat> so the first part is that you have a, a constant entry of um, constant input of the healthy liver cell next you have a growth term a logistic growth you have a death term of the cell now here why this t plus i is has been put that is because here k is the carrying capacity of the uh, liver cells now t is the healthy liver cell i is the infected liver cell but this carrying capacity uh, they do not, does not distinguish between the healthy one and the unhealthy one so overall the carrying capacity is k of the whole liver cell whether it is infected or whether it is uninfected so that's why these two variables has been taken uh, this is the important part so what it says is when the virus vi comes in contact with the healthy liver cell it is infecting at a rate alpha now then what are these terms so eta 1 is the so when you take any drug it has its efficacy that is the way the successful way it works so the uh, we we can measure that uh, so eta 1 is the efficacy of such a drug interferon and eta r is the efficacy of rivabiri now when you take the drug not that 100% of the drug is working a fraction of the drug is working so you multiply it by c so a fraction of the drug is working and when I subtract it from one, this gives the non-efficacy of the drug. And due to the non-efficacy of the drug, that means the drug is not working, your liver cell, they are now converting into a infected liver cell at a rate alpha. So that's why this whole term has now come here. These are the natural deaths of the cell for both all of them. And this is again the combined uh therapy of both interferon and rivabirin 
and this is the non-efficacy when they are not working and which give rise to the infectious virus or infectious virals. Now you can ask the question why you have taken that eta r by eta y by 2. Well, <coughs> you could have taken some a eta 1 plus b eta r by a plus b where you can choose a to be 3, b to be 5. Uh, but it gives the same dynamics with uh, eta 1 plus eta r when you choose a equal to b equal to 1. So why make things complicated when you can obtain the similar result with a simplified form? So that's why a equal to b equal to 1 has been chosen. So now you are familiar with what is called the equilibrium point. <clears throat> so you find the equilibrium point and it is very important to get a disease-free equilibrium point. Otherwise, you will never have a uh, you know, virus which has been eradicated. So there has to, the model has to be framed in such a manner that you have a disease-free equilibrium point and you have an endemic equilibrium point. So the whole dynamics here, it will be that you check the stability of the disease-free equilibrium point, you check the stability of the endemic equilibrium point. By endemic equilibrium point, I mean when all the values are non-zero. So you have an endemic equilibrium point. And you will see that now there will be existing a transcritical bifurcation where one crosses a particular uh, bifurcating value. You will see when this was stable and this was unstable. So <clears throat> once it crosses, this becomes unstable and this becomes stable. So that is uh, the most important dynamics that we will be using it to get our results. And how we do that? <clears throat> okay, this is uh, the stability analysis we have done. Uh, yeah, so this is the important part. So <clears throat> it is proved that the steady state E0, that is virus free, is stable if R0 is less than one, where R0 have some expression, something like that. So if I now plot the values of t hat and t star, I will get something like this in terms of eta, where eta is your combined efficacy of the drug. So this is the bifurcation point, means eta c equal to this is the bifurcation point, and that's a transcritical bifurcation. So if <coughs> this value is greater than nc, then your viral load will be stable. That will, you will approach a value where you will be uh, clinically cured. And if eta is less than the critical value, then your system will converge. It will be stable, but it will converge to a new steady state, which will be lower than the previous steady state. But you still will have the virus inside your body. So here, the application of this transcritical bifurcation it has been used and they are explained in the biological manner in the context of the problem. So that's how your dynamical system uh, is used in a mathematical model like this. And then you have the parameter values, you plug the values of the parameter and you try to get the dynamics uh, that you so I want to replicate the dynamics that is seen in a, uh, in a patient suffering from hepatitis C virus. So what happens is that first is the interferon monotherapy. And in interferon monotherapy, what happens is that once you take the interferon, so there is a first phase decline, which is a very sharp here followed by a second phase decline, which is now going like this. So if you have a more efficacy of the drug, you attend an SVR, which is somewhere around, say, 22 or 23 days. And you can see that I have put 10 square here and not zero, because as stated earlier, that if you have uh, 100 virus per ml, you have received, you, you, have, you are clinically cured. So if you have 10 square or 100, then uh, 
uh, you are clinically cured. Okay. <clears throat> Next is now you have interferon along with rivibiri. So the thing was that it is believed that once you have one drug, and then again, if you push another drug, it is going to work. But in this particular case, it doesn't happen that. What happened is, <clears throat> if I show you both the figure and compare, you see that this is the monotherapy and this is with respect to, uh, this is when you have taken the rivibrin. So both of them uh, give sort of identical figure. So, uh, and why is that? Because here the efficacy of rivibrin is zero and here the efficacy of rivibrin is 0 0.3. So, rivibrin didn't work uh, in this case. That is because uh, later which the doctors or the clinicians found out that once your <coughs> interferon, efficacy of interferon, they sort of faded out or reaches a moderate low value. At that point, if the rivibrin is pushed, and then where it starts working. So, what I did is, that I change this efficacy of interferon to 0.4 and then I put the rivibrin and you can see that it is sort of 19 days in which the patient is cured and which matches with the uh, clinical observation. And again, it is a biphasic decline because this is the first phase followed by the second phase. Now, this is uh, interferon monotherapy. So, this is just to capture the dynamics that the drug doesn't work always. It is a 50% success. Uh, so, you can see that there is an interferon monotherapy which started with the virus to decline, but then it relapses. So, it doesn't work and we call them the uh, non-responders. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, they also tried rivabirin monotherapy and it's totally failed. As you can see that uh, there is a very less decline and then it goes to some steady state. Okay, this is what happens that when you stop the drug. So the person was on the drug for 14 days and then after that the therapy is stopped just to see what happens. And as expected, the virus shoots up and it goes to some steady state value, which is less than this value, of course. <clears throat> so sometimes this triphasic decline of viral load is also seen. That is, this is the first phase, this is the second phase, and this is the third phase of the viral load uh, achieving SVR. However, if we modify the model where we have added one more proliferation term of logistic type, you get the figure something like this. And this is the one value which is uh, more seen in the patients that there is a first phase decline followed by a shoulder phase, a constant phase, and then this called the second phase, and then comes the third phase. So, the conclusion is that yeah, the model which we created, they, try, they sort of mimic uh, the dynamics of hepatitis C virus, which is seen in patients with successful therapy with interferon and rivabirin. So, I will stop here. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the forum is open for discussion, questions, and gratitude. Yes. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Sir, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening.
I want to ask uh, a fundamental question, sir. So, first, uh, looking at the title, I thought uh, uh, you'll be deriving some model for uh, the dynamics of virus itself. So, I think I wrongly thought like that. <laughs> So, no, it, is are, the, uh, it, it is the model of uh, virus itself, actually. Okay. No, but uh, uh, you are looking at the samples. So, what is the number of virus in each patient in every day and how it decreases depending upon the medicine? So, is it correct? Yes, yes, yes. Not the, okay. So, you were thinking of, uh, means the life no. cycle of a virus. Uh, yes, sir. I thought like that, sir. Okay, okay. No, no. It is not the right uh, life cycle of the virus. It is the how the virus is infecting the liver cells and the corresponding drugs. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, you will uh, calculate the number of virus uh, using blood samples and how it is done, sir? No, no. So, basically, the <coughs> parameter values came from this paper, of these three papers. Uh, where they already calculated the rate at which uh, it is happening. Okay, sir. I took the parameter values from there. So, no okay. experiments involved from my part. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. But it is a, a very important topic you are doing, sir. So, my, my best wishes to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sendhil sir, for organizing such a nice event, sir. So I, I am able to participate today only because uh, due to work pressure and all, it is difficult for me to find time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please spike button. Yeah. So any questions from students uh, others? Sir, I have one question. Uh, sir, how far it uh, matches with the experiment? I mean, experimental results. I mean, with the okay. Paper. So this model mimics uh, the dynamics that is seen in pres in uh, you know in patients. Uh, that is the first phase decline, the second phase decline. Uh, so this mimics. It is fine, but the thing is that I already know the results. I know that uh, there will be a first phase decline, there will be a second phase decline and so on. But still why people are working on this is the drugs, they cost very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this interferon and rivabirin is only available in India and our third world countries like this. That too in a quite, you know, per day 10,000 rupees kind of thing. It's not affordable by a common person. Uh, the drug which is now available and it will be given an instant cure is extremely, you know, expensive. Uh, that is only available in US and even their uh, insurance company doesn't cover that. Okay. It is something like like $10,000 a day, which is uh, quite high. So the, the, the mathematical modelers are trying to, you know, optimize the cost uh, of this drug. So that is the current work that is happening actually. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, so any other question? So okay. I'm not getting any questions sir, because of the people are <laughs> after the yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, no, no, sorry. Uh, am I audible? Yes, 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 sir. yes sir. Go ahead. So I have a question. You made some assumptions regarding P and Q that uh, limit X tends to zero, Y tends to zero, P of X, Y and Q of X, Y should uh, tend to zero uh, for this kind of a model to work. Uh, in, in the premise of your work, uh, has those been, you know, testified or falsified? Yeah, I mean, those are basically done by the students. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, any other question or clarifications? Okay. So, I'm not getting questions. So, okay. since since there are no questions, uh, I would like to conclude the session uh, by thanking Professor Sandeep Banerjee for giving for accepting our invitation and giving a very interesting talk.
in this forum. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Param sir. Okay. I would like to you all the other feedbacks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.